Yeah, thank you and welcome everybody to what is our third um, webinar series on um, our topic or our theme of sustainability. I'm Keith Newton um, uh, and I'm the uh, Secretary General of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. Um, and I'm very pleased uh, today to uh, welcome our three speakers. Um, the focus today is on oceans and maritime logistics and, trans and the transport industry um, in that maritime and ports um, sector. Uh, but we've got a very wide focus today geographically. Um, so we have uh, Margaret Kidd, who's uh, joining us actually from Greece, but um, is from the University of Houston. And I'll give an introduction to Margaret as the first speaker um, shortly. Um, we've got uh, Sarinda Umambure from uh, Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, Sarinda is uh, actually going to give us um, a, sp a perspective, um, a diff bit of a different perspective, but I'll leave that introduction until he speaks uh, <laughs> the second uh, time round um, as our second speaker. And then we welcome uh, Madam Nar Densuri Arik. T. Ariti um, from uh, uh, Ghana, um, and uh, Noah will be given giving us um, a view from Africa. So you can see geographically we've got uh, uh, a big scope, which is um, quite appropriate, seeing as uh, um, oceans cover um, nearly three quarters of our globe and are in many senses the barometer of. Um, sustainability um, in terms of some of the issues that uh, we face um, both in the logistics and transport field and um, as people on our planet. So um, can I introduce, um, move off my introduction, I'll go quiet, um, but I want to introduce with a little bit more um, detail Margaret Kidd um, who is the Program Director for, of Supply Chain and Logistics Technology at the University of Houston. Um, it's great, with great pleasure I welcome uh, Margaret. Um, she's been very instrumental um, in working with, um, with CRT in North America and with CRT International over the last year. Um, it, in her um, her notes, she, um, I note that she's developed a global powerhouse advisory board composed of um, importers, exporters, manufacturers, port authorities, maritime stakeholders, and, and CRT in North America and CRT International have uh, uh, very much been um, part of that. Um, and Margaret will share a little bit about that, but also give us insight particularly into the role of corporate response, social responsibility, how that fits into the port, port sector, and also foc focus on the skills, training, and community development um, with her experience um, in um, particularly um, in um, fr from the United States of America. So um, I will hand over to Margaret, and uh, Margaret will lead us through uh, her presentation. Margaret, over to you. Thank you, Keith. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. This is a fabulous topic. It's close and dear to my heart. Um, and without further ado, let me share my screen. Okay, I'm assuming everyone can see this. So I am gonna be talking about sustainability more from the lens of social and the, it, how, what that impact is for communities and, and employment. So I wanna start with a definition of sustainability and then build up and end with actionable opportunities for port communities. So sustainable development's not a new term that dates back decades, but really became on the forefront in 1987 with the Brundtland Report on, from the World Commission on Environment and Development. And this is a common definition, our common future as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability for future generations to meet their needs. Flash forward to 2015, you have the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals created and ratified. 
For purposes of our discussion today, I'm going to be looking really at just two of these sustainable development goals, number eight and number 11, decent work with economic growth and then sustainable cities and communities. So if we're all striving to get to that ubiquitous triple bottom line, we've got to balance environment, social and economic interest. I have a very brief literature review on corporate social responsibility in port communities, just based on the time that we've allotted for, for my presentation. But corporate social responsibility is a term we know well in the corporate world. It's a fairly new term when we're talking about the maritime industry or port authorities. But essentially, CSR is a tool that companies use to establish positive relations with their surroundings, which means communities, and to gain competitive advantage. Today, we're going to just look at the S, the social in this corporate social responsibility in communities. And we're going to look at community engagement and employment. Um, for another talk, we'll look at political and, and legal issues, but not today. So when we think about community impact, the very first thing we've got to identify is who are the stakeholders? So at the end of the day, there's four major groups that from the macro level, it's everybody, it's society at large. In the secondary level, it's the competitors, the customers, the community, the financial institutions. At a third level, it's the organization itself and the employees. And at the fourth level, it's peers, family, and friends. So each of these groups interacts differently with, with the port. And you know, there's a perception that each group has. So the organization has to manage to these stakeholders in, in different ways. And one of, some of the engagement strategies that we see globally um, from port authorities are donations, sponsorships of awards, community investments, um, com community development even. Um, and then as it relates to employment and training, uh, there is clearly a skills gap. Uh, Betty Aurelio from the Caribbean did a study on Caribbean port workers and only 20% were getting any on the job training. World Bank also did a study on logistics competencies, and there is truly a gap that we all need to address. At the end of the day, we, we've got to think in terms of building a pipeline and putting training um, contextually out of the category of cost, but into the category of competitive advantage, and then transitioning to a digitized world and training that, that allows workers to move into that digitized world. So as we look to train our next generation workers, that's gonna happen through scholarships, internships, apprenticeships, and K through 12 outreach. Finally, all, all these good deeds need to be recorded. And currently there is no global standardized method for reporting port sustainability. There's no global participation. We need benchmarks for economic, environment, and social. And it needs to address scale, scale from the context of number of TEUs or tonnage that's processed by various ports. Historically, sustainability from ports has been reported in the context of environment. The triple bottom line is not just environment, it's social and economic also. And we've got to you know, pay tribute to that. European ports have been at the forefront for at least tracking environment through EcoPorts, which is a self-diagnosis method and, and the peer system. But again, that's not enough. It's not covering the social and the economic. So for purposes of this presentation, I did um, a case study of three global ports using a content analysis of public websites and strictly looked at their community impact and what they were doing related to employment or training. So our first port, um, no surprise, um, is Port of Houston, the home port for the city that I'm from, the city of Houston. And they've recently come out with a program called their Community Grants. And they took, they actually, this was very exciting because they created a public procurement process 
and then had a matrix for ranking projects and then a committee to, to decide which projects would be funded. And then those that receive funding are accountable for reporting results and updating quarterly what's going on with these grant funds. And so these are topics that go everywhere from workforce development to community improvement, maritime, and then environmental stewardship. Um, I personally received one of these grants and my project was related to supply chain and logistics workforce development. Um, really nice that our new website at University of Houston, Research Reaching Houston, um, publicized a story uh, about a month ago about this project. Um, Port of Houston has a number of initiatives related to community. I think that the one I would highlight the most is what they've done for maritime education. They've become the nexus for the logistics high schools, the community colleges, and the universities. They annually host a uh, maritime youth expo. They have internships and there's scholarships that reach out to all three levels, um, high school, community college, and university. There's a number of other activities and this presentation will be available so everyone can review it. Moving south, down to south of America, Porto de Sioux, which is a private port north of Rio de Janeiro, um, really interesting. There were a green, it's a greenfield site. It's a new port. They do address sustainability on their website. Um, and they've been very active in working hand in hand with a community that was historically a traditional, traditional fishing village, right? So um, all sorts of infrastructure, educational programming, um, equipment, um, essentially working to coexist in a very positive manner. Moving to Europe, I wanted to highlight Port of Hamburg. Not only do they have a sustainability plan and use the global reporting initiative, um, they are port intertwined with the city in the middle of Hamburg and, and coexist um, communities with port. Um, what was extremely refreshing was their concept of making the port an attractive place to work, um, providing opportunities for training and upskilling their current employees and methods for recruiting new employees. What was most fascinating is that their stakeholder, stakeholder dialogue and establishing targets of improving relationships, both with employees, suppliers, customers, and then civil society overall. Okay, um, moving to the World Port Sustainability Program, there is a platform where global ports that are members of the International Association of Ports and Harbors can showcase um, sustainability projects. And I've highlighted a couple of projects from Port of Asu here. And then on the next slide, several projects from the Port of Hamburg. Certainly Port of Houston might consider um, submitting their community grants program um, to be accepted um, to these really you know, global type projects. So let me close on some actionable opportunities for port communities. The World Bank in logistics competency skills and training um, provides clear evidence, whether you're in North America or South Asia, that there's an opportunity to grow our community workforce. Whether it's driving a truck, working as a logistics manager, working at administration, there's a shortage of these workers. So the opportunities there, regardless which continent you live on. There's also a huge opportunity to upskill. As my friend Lorianne LaRocco said, trade is people. So I ran this graph a couple of days ago using Germany, which is really, um, that's the platinum scale for logistics competencies. And I looked at Germany, United States. Um, I just, I chose one country in Africa and one country in Southeast Asia. And you can do this comparison on a regional basis. But as you can see, there's an opportunity for us to work collectively to, to upskill. At the end of the day, global trade is only as strong as its weakest link. 
And if we're linking between continents, we need to collectively address the skills um, situation. So here at University of Houston, we offer a number of opportunities for workforce development and upskilling. Um, most notable that's what we launched is an offshore wind logistics certification. And then secondly, we've come out with some programs geared towards um, South America and Guyana and upskilling uh, to meet the demands of the oil and ener energy sector there. Let me close on this. Um, there is a need for consistency for global reporting. I highly emphasize the global reporting initiative. It's a framework, economic, social, and environmental. There's targets, there's transparency. All of the European ports are using this methodology. The Port of Sydney is using it, and it is a best practice. So here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out if you have questions after this presentation. And um, all of the material, I have links here, and I thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Margaret. Um, that was. Uh... A, a very excellent presentation, a very comprehensive. Um, I've been, I've had the privilege of looking at um, the slides, and uh, Margaret's got all sorts of links there that um, uh, can be um, uh, can be run through. So I, I know there's already been a question. I think from uh, one of the attendees. Yes, the the presentation and the um, and the recording will be available next week for um, those who want to um, dig in a bit deeper. Um, Margaret, I'd like to, before we move on, and we've got a little bit of time just to um, check in with you on that, I thought um, very much um, your, um, your focus on community and skills is quite, in some senses, is quite a unique focus, um, particularly the way that you built up there, the stakeholders. Um, and, and probably applicable, I think, into other sectors other than maritime, but um, and you mentioned at the end there the, the global reporting and the, the need still to, to drive that so that there's a common accepted um, set of measures um, for sustainability across the world. Um, but could you just give, give us a perspective? How, how um, widespread is that focus um, on community and skills in the um, in the industry and are you hopeful that um, that um, the adoption will become um, universal for for some of those measurements uh, that you had there Keith that's an excellent question I know in Houston it's been a big focus we have an aging workforce but we're seeing the same thing in Germany I think you know the next several years, over 20% of workers in this maritime sector are going to be retiring. So it's critical that we be attracting that next generation of worker. And the only way we can do that to build that pipeline is outreach. And we need to go past just high schools. We need to drill down to the intermediate skills, schools and maybe even elementary and show them you know, this is what a career looks like. So it's on us to, to do that. Um, as far as reporting, there is no question there needs to be a universal standard. Using the GRI um, under the category of social, there's actually, um, there's data points that have to be included related to employee training, related to community engagement, even related to supplier assessment, um, stakeholder enga engagement plans. So I think it, you know, if, if we're following United Nations sustainable development goals as a framework, um, we need to align and report universally on all of these activities. Yes, no, good. I, and uh, I think the, um, we'll come back to that when we do in the more general, because it is probably a topic that others will um, also want to chip in, because it's interesting, isn't it, that the, the UN um, goals that you, you, that, you know, the, uh, uh, that you, you mentioned have become quite mainstream, but then um, I, I think your, your focus on stakeholder and stakeholders and uh, how's that viewed is quite, is quite, 
um, innovative and um, uh, potentially um, uh, could really engage and involve um, the, 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 the all of us really in uh, because often we we tend to um, just focus in on our own business goals, don't we? But the environment is so much bigger than that, and sustainability is so much bigger than that. So, and Keith, um, let me just add one last thought. I think that this last eighteen months during COVID has shown us how critical supply chain and port authority operations are. I mean, it's beyond just toilet paper and Clorox. I mean, what are you, and it's beyond not getting your Christmas toy. It's about critical supplies. Mm. So we do need to be talking about sustainability and thank you for hosting us today. No, thank you. That, that's that's great. And thank you so much for that um, very uh, um, short, short, but detailed and quick in, uh, an insight. Um, perfect for, for today's topic to set up um, what we're now going to move on um, with, which I think overall is a very holistic approach to um, sustainability and with this focus on maritime. Um, so thank you, Margaret. Um, I now move on to our second speaker. Um, so I mentioned uh, um, Surinda, I introduced Surinda Mabuvi from um, Sri Lanka um, to start with a little bit more detail on Surinda. So he is the CEO of MAS Creda. Um, now that uh, may not be a, a business known to you, may, may be um, to many already, but um, just a little bit, um, MAS is um, hosted in um, headquarters in in Sri Lanka, and that's where the business was formed. Um, it now has 52 manufacturing locations um, across 17 countries. Is um, I understand a little bit of it, um, facts that I, I dug out were that it's the second largest um, supplier to Nike. Um, so, uh, and uh, Surinda, in terms of heading up MAS Creda. MAS Creda is um, very focused on the um, sporting um, apparel world. Um, you might ask, well, um, why are we involving manufacturing in um, logistics and transport? And the answer is very simple, uh, because we are looking, as, as we talked about earlier, about this sort of holistic approach. Um, and of course, manufacturing is a very key part of the supply chain. Um, but what's interesting and what Surinda will build on um, today is um, the, the way that um, ethical and sustainable um, work environments have been built into his business. And um, he has um, a lot of experience in that area and he's going to share that with us, it, um, but with particular focus on a very innovative project um, that is actually tackling um, an area of, in, a big area of environmental concern in a small way and showing how businesses um, can do that. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Surinder. Okay. O over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be around the world. Thank you very much, Keith, for inviting me to have a chat with you guys. Um, very interesting listening to what uh, Margaret had to say a little while ago and uh, what I'd like to talk about here is how MAS and MAS Creda have been addressing the issue of ocean plastic in Sri Lanka. It's a fairly broad topic, and um, I, I don't think there's a direct relationship with uh, what you guys do as a profession, but certainly what we are trying to do is keep the oceans clean around, in and around Sri Lanka. Um, if you can just flip over to the next slide. So one of the things about the apparel industry, folks, is that apparel is considered to be the second most polluting industry on the planet. And one of the things that we really have to look at is the future, how we're going to continue doing this and how we are going to ensure that the damage we are doing is going to be reversed and we somehow end up being net, poly, uh, net positive to planet. So there are many different areas that we work on. We work on waste disposal, we work on chemical disposal, we work on clean water, um, uh, emission control, all those things. But on the, on the side of plastic, uh, this has to do with a bit of a uh, personal story and how we started looking at that as a, 
um, as a topic that we wanted to focus on. Um, I did a charity walk a couple of years ago, and when we were walking along, we were walking from the southernmost tip of Sri Lanka to the northernmost tip, which is about a 650 kilometer, 620 kilometer journey. And we noticed the amount of plastic waste that was all over on the sides of the roads. There's a big problem with pollution, and there's a big problem with plastic being tossed around. During the walk, I was chatting with some colleagues of mine, and we decided to start looking into the problem of how do we dispose of this plastic and how we how do we and to understand the problem a little better. What we realized was the biggest problem we were facing was from ocean plastic. Because Sri Lanka, most of you all are familiar with the geographic layout of it, where we are positioned, we seem to catch the currents from all different uh, angles of, um, of our all the different angles that you can think of. And starting from looking at the East Coast, we start having wash from uh, as far as Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, those countries uh, coming onto our beaches. Um, on the West side, we have some of the African countries sending their garbage over to us. But the biggest problem that we have is that we have a huge wash coming down the Indian subcontinent and ending up on our shores. So if you go to the northern part of Sri Lanka, you will find that the population density is extremely low. But if you walk onto some of our beaches that at one point were pristine, beautiful beaches, they're now covered in plastic, mainly plastic. Um, and then of course, there's all kinds of other stuff also that washes on board, so on the shore. So what we started talking uh, about was how could we, one, clean the beaches first. So. To that end, what we did was we started speaking with the Sri Lanka Navy, and the Navy partnered us, the partner with us, in creating collection centers in naval uh, um, dispatches that they had along the beach, where villagers could come and even uh, you know start uh, handing over plastic. And we started paying people a small amount of money for collecting this plastic, and just started making it like a civic activity, a social activity, where people. Um, got together in groups, clubs, formed uh, whatever initiatives that they had uh, to clean this plastic and bring it to collection centers. Initially, what we started doing with the collection centers is we are trying to figure out how we could then create some kind of economic impact out of this. And Keith, if I may just ask you to flip over to the, third, the, the last slide. Initially, we just had the collection points. We were collecting it and then trying to find small industries. Like, for example, some people started compressing it and making uh, flower pots out of uh, plastic. They started making ornaments out of plastic. But it was nothing really sustainable and of the scale that could take care of the entire plastic issue. So then we started talking to a company called Eco Spindles. They were a spin-off of a company, uh, no pun intended. Uh, they were a spin-off of a company called... Um, uh, pair of brushes that used plastic filament in making home brushes, like paint brushes, that kind of stuff. And with them, they started investing in a company that could actually take this plastic, refine it, and create a yarn that could then be converted into a fabric. And this started uh, a real, like a revolution in Sri Lanka in that sense, that a lot of the plastic that we started collecting off our beaches was then taken, collected, taken to eco spindles. It went through a selection process because not all the plastic can be used in, in making fabric. But we started getting an economic benefit out of collecting that fabric and then making it into a yarn and then subsequently making uh, fabric out of that yarn. And now that's a pretty successful business. And what it's also done is it's taken pretty much all the ocean plastic that we can find in Sri Lanka and created an economic uh, benefit out of it. Uh, I'm not saying that the problem is sorted because this is stuff that gets washed on, on board almost every day. But what's happened is the, the requirement that we need from plastic right now cannot be met with just what's just washed up on the ocean, uh, on the shores, but we're actually importing now waste plastic from places like Thailand uh, for this industry uh, to make sure that we have adequate waste plastic to convert into uh, polyester fabric. Then what we started looking at was, and Keith, I may now request you to flip to the other one, is we started looking at what we were doing from within Sri Lanka to uh, make a, uh, you know, dump garbage in our oceans. Because as you can see the statistics here, 
there's a massive amount of garbage that comes through the canal system and the river system that Sri Lanka has quite a few of. I think we have about 280 rivers and canals that empty into the ocean. A bulk of this is in the Western province. The Western province is the most populated province in the country. And what happens is a lot of the riverside dwellers, since there is a very poor collection of garbage, the easiest thing to do is to chuck everything into the canals. What also happens is when garbage is thrown onto, say, a side of a road or you know anything um, where it's not formally collected in the city of Colombo, for example, it's quite clean and, and you don't see this kind of stuff. But in the suburbs, um, this gets washed with rainwater and finds its way into the drain system, into the canal system, and then into the ocean. And what we were able to come up with, with a local company, was a very simple strainer system. And what you can see on the left of this slide is this strainer that is put at an angle across any canal. And it's a flotation device on top with like a net that captures, it's such a simple thing, uh, with a net that captures garbage at the bottom. And you hook it onto two, you, you, it requires a fair amount of tensile strength because the uh, water pressure can become quite severe with the garbage behind it um, when, the, when the rains come in and the monsoons hit, for example. So we, there's obviously a, um, um, a tension requirement and a strength requirement. And we created one of these and we piloted it extremely successfully in one of the most polluted canals in the country. And what you can see in the second picture and third picture is we collect the garbage. We've employed people at the at canal mouth where they collect the garbage, pile it up, and then it's taken away into a waste to energy power station. And it's burnt for uh, whatever can be used in our recycling plant. We take it there. Otherwise, the rest of it just goes into the, uh, into the waste to energy plant. So what we have been able to do is find a solution that prevents this garbage getting washed into the ocean. What we have also done is, this is a simple process, and um, obviously we had the patent to it, but we have opened it to anybody who's interested. And now we are partnering with several of the local uh, beverage manufacturers. We are partnering with all, uh, various people around the country to roll this out into as many of our river systems and canal systems as practically possible. There are practical difficulties where, for example, there's boat traffic or ship traffic going up and down any of these uh, waterways, but those we're working on as well with the gate system that we're incorporating. And I'm hoping that within the, the rest of this year, we have rolled it out in about three canals as of now. It's still early days, uh, but we're hoping that by the end of the year, we would have at least a dozen of the, of the most polluting canals and rivers in Sri Lanka. In, in, while we are doing this as an organization, what we have done is we ban single-use plastic on our premises. There are, you know, we ban things like even lunch packet, uh, lunch papers. Lunch papers are very popular in Sri Lanka. What they do is um, a lunch sheets. It's a plastic sheet where they wrap their lunch in. They come, they eat their lunch, and then they toss the sheet out. So those have been banned, banned in our uh, plants. We have given everybody um, reusable lunch boxes. Uh, there are no plastic bottles uh, in our premises, and wherever possible, uh, we have taken away the use of single-use plastic almost entirely. So we are doing a little bit internally as well to ensure that we don't add to this pollution. And what we we, we would um, like to do is invite people, and what what I can do is send you all the details through Keith um, to get in touch with us to partner us and and. It can be rolled out anywhere, any, in any country, any river. So hopefully this will uh, encourage several of you to partner your customers and your friends and businesses um, to make sure that our oceans are kept clean. Thank you, Keith. Thank you so much, Sarinda. Um, I would like to, to um, just ask you, that the, the reason why um, your um, approach um, firstly really inter interested us um, as I said at the start it wasn't it's not so typically we've been looking at um, sustainability um, with a logistics and transport focus so we, we focused on freight decarbonization um, uh, last time around with Professor Alan McKinnon but um, what's very interesting with your approach with within Mars is um, is how you've looked much wider than um, than just 
your industry and you've gone into this um, and within that you found solutions that and then feed back in because you're actually using some of the materials then back in the industry. But um, what I thought would be interesting for, for us as professionals really is, is how you've done that because that, that's very much a leadership approach in most businesses. Most businesses will be constrained in terms of looking at um, sustainability, perhaps from um, the pollution, the emissions that they are directly responsible for. But you've not done that. You've done, you've looked at it wider and differently, and that that displays a sort of leadership approach within within Mars. Um, could could you sort of comment on that on uh, uh, how that developed and how um, how you see that? Uh, so I think about five or six years, no, actually it was a little longer than about seven years ago, we started making a commitment um, within, within ourselves as an organization to make an impact to the environment that we work in. We had always been a socially conscious uh, uh, manufacturer or an organization. And in the Sri Lankan context, we are a $2 billion company. So we are, if not the largest, one of the top three largest companies in the country. So, and we employ over a hundred thousand people. So in that context, what we have always believed is that we are in a position to make a difference, not just to the localities that we work in, but to the country as a whole. Sri Lanka is a small island and an organization our size, if we decide to do something, we can do it on the scale that would impact the entire country. So we picked several areas. We have started a very aggressive reforestation program that we are hoping to reforest up to 25,000. I'm hoping it'll go up to more, more like 30 or 40,000 um, uh, uh, acres worth of uh, um, degraded forest. Uh, we've been looking at water. We've been looking at uh, wind power, solar power, and green energy. So various aspects like that. What we have done is taken different aspects of um, how the planet is being impacted, water, mm -hmm. waste, chemical, uh, energy, that, and really tried to dig into those and make an impact. So mm -hmm. this was one of those projects that we looked at. Um, and a few years ago, I used to drive the sustainability initiatives within the group um, mm -hmm. as a second part of my responsibility. So I'm, I've always been a passionate conservationist. And uh, this is something that I felt that we could make an impact with. And it has been quite successful. So I believe that organizations sometimes, you know, I don't like the, uh, the term, uh, you know, but, but the greenwash stuff, you know, they do a little bit on the surface and then talk about mm. it. As I say, you, you do 10 rupees worth of work and 90 rupees worth of shouting. But what we like to do is really get involved in particular projects and then make successful efforts out of it and not try to do it alone, Keith. We have mm. always looked at whatever we are doing we invite other organizations to partner with us. Mm -hmm. So even if it's mm -hmm. reforestation, we say, we're going to do 100, um, you know, uh, 10 hectares here, 100 hectares here, come and join us. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a collective effort. So we're trying to start a movement rather than just, uh, you know, do one small initiative. Yes, no, that, that's excellent. I think, I, I think for all our uh, uh, listeners to this webinar, it, it, it does, um, it, 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 it it reinforces the need to look outside. It, it reinforces the need to uh, look outside of the business, the need to collaborate and work with others um, and to take leadership in this way. Um, and the environment is, and, and, uh, and the topic of sustainability, I think, is challenging us to do that in a very different way. So thank you so much for that um, example. We'll go back into that topic, I think, when we start to talk a little bit, because I think... Um, you know, it, bring, it links with what Margaret was talking earlier about stakeholders. It links with um, training because it, you know, um, it's it's not just training at lower levels. It's it's actually leadership and management training, isn't it? That you've obviously um, taken some significant steps in your organisation to um, change the focus. Um, so thank you, Surinder. I'll give you a rest now, um, and we. We'll move on to our last speaker. Um, so I promised right at the start um, today that uh, uh, we would have this wide uh, geographical look at um, um, sustainability in the maritime sector. And I'm very pleased to welcome um, Madam Nar, 
back to the um, uh, to actually um, present with um, very much a um, focus on, on Africa for us. Um, now, uh, Noah has um, been, um, she's got 30 years experience in the Maritime Trade and Logistics Centre. She's a Vice President in CRT Ghana, um, so very much involved in uh, the Institute in, in Africa. Uh, but as well as that, she's got a very wide um, background and experience globally. So she's a member of the Board of Governments, Go Governors of the World Maritime University, um, which is in Sweden, um, and an executive member of the, interna uh, the inter uh, an, an International Director of the Women's International Shipping and Trading Association, WISTA. So, um, uh, no, um Please give us your perspective on maritime sustainability with an emphasis on Africa. And over to you. Thank you, Keith. And thank you for inviting me for this webinar. It's actually my first time of being on Silt International webinar, and I find it very interesting. Um, my presentation is actually looking at green shipping and um, sustainable shipping and um, a bit of reference to Africa. I'm currently not the vice president for logistics. I used to be, but currently I am not. And But it's my pleasure to join you this afternoon to make my short presentation. I hope I'll be on time. I would like to share my screen at this time. Okay, in keeping trade flows, and it's an indispensable and essential tool for both developed and developing economies. Yet, it is said to account for 3% of carbon dioxide. And uh, that calls us to wonder that such a, a, a useful thing that we all depend on, such as maritime transport, will cause damage to the environment. I listened carefully to uh, Margaret's uh, presentation on sustainability and um, what uh, Serenda is also doing to sustain the environment in the various, uh, especially in um, Sri Lanka. And I said to myself, there will be no need for me to go through what sustainability is all about because we have, we have been given a good um, introduction to that. So I would look as a current status of shipping with respect to sustainability. And then um, we look at how the economy, that is maritime transport, fits into the three pillars of sustainability on the economic front, on the environmental side, and on the uh, societal front. You look at the economic front and you know that um, maritime transport is very important and that companies are seeking for business efficiency. And on the environmental side, there's an increase in regulatory compliance for ship owners to enforce decarbonization and see them support the goals of IMO. And on the societal front, organizations are taking the need for diversity and inclusion and working on it. In a recent international forum, where the Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization, in his keynote address, stated that following the immense social, I have a problem with my, <laughs> social and economic impact of the uh, pandemic on the shipping industry, it is time to pave the emerging future. He said, we have opportunity to drive a green recovery and ensure, I was trying to quote it, oh, I don't know why my screen is doing this. And to drive a sustainable maritime future, to keep, to keep pace with the demands of the global economy and the expectation for sustainable growth in the maritime world, which needs to be at the forefront of transformational change. So looking at green shipping and sustainable growth, there are two things, increased digitalization and decarbonization to tackle the issue of climate change. 
we look at increased digitalization, that is the exchange of information between ships and ports, which is the platform that is mandatory under the IMO FAR Convention. We're going to look at what the international industry is doing. Wider endorsement of the single window portal to strengthen efficiency where various government agencies can submit information to one single portal, which will also be good for the supply chain because there will be transparency and things will be dealt with quickly. And this adds up to uh, things moving quickly and faster and there are no delays within the supply chain. And all actors within the supply chain are happy to be part of it. Digitalization must be implemented at all ports and in all countries across the globe. It should not be for just a few. It is encouraged for e-navigation, harmonization, standardization, and all of these things should consider the needs of the user interfaces. And I think that IMO is at the forefront and driving this sustainable growth. It is said that it is better to drive it from the global level than do it on the regional level in order to create um, a level playing field for everyone. So at the end of the day, we all have a good reason to enjoy a very good um, climate and sustainable growth in the maritime sector. We'll look at decarbonization as one of the key instruments of green shipping and sustainable growth. It is said that decarbonization is a real challenge for the maritime industry, but already IMO is raising standards and bringing out regulations to reduce greenhouse emissions. We have the short, the medium and long-term measures. When we look at the short-term measures, we see that by January, 2023, IMO has put in place regulation on energy efficiency index for existing ships and then the carbon intensity indicator that will monitor ships that are already existing and then follow up on their speed limits as well as what they have in terms of their carriage of passengers and um, goods. This is for the short-term measure which will take place in 2023. All of these are efforts to reduce um, the greenhouse emissions that do affect um, climate change. IM also has the goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% as its medium term. And then in the long term to reduce it by 50%. And these are targets that um, IMO has set, which member states have already agreed on as far back as 2008. No individual countries to be left out. Therefore, there's a need for support for small island developing states and least developed countries like in Africa. In the fight against climate change, the shipping industry will have to work with maritime stakeholders, including public and private sectors banks, academia, and all who work with the IMO in order that we all, by 2050, can attain the 50% reduction in climate in um, greenhouse emissions. And there's a need, therefore, to help developing nations to also be compliant. When we look at Africa, Africa has 33 of the least developed countries. Africa's blue economy is made up of vast lakes, rivers, and extensive resource base. 38 of the 54 African states are coastal states. And more than 90% of Africa's imports and exports are by sea. And some of the most strategic gateways for international trade in Africa is done in Africa, underscoring the geopolitical importance of the region. However, intra-African trade is low for Africa. We do not trade a lot amongst ourselves, 
but with the establishment of the African continental free trade, it is envisaged and it is hoped and expected that Africa would trade amongst itself more, that there will be more trade and therefore more shipping. In so doing, we are calling for green and sustainable shipping. That is, we need to be abreast with what is going on on the international scene. What IMO and its partners are doing, Africa needs to follow up. <clears throat> we are not a continent on our own because we work with our partners also. Our trading partners are Europe, the Americas, Asia, and we need to be in line. Like I said, no country will be left behind. And therefore, Africa should not be left behind in maintaining a green and sustainable shipping. We are looking at the Integrated Technical Cooperation Program of IMO, which is to assist developing nations to build human and institutional capacity, a uniformed and effective compliance. We believe that IMO and its partners, this support will go a long way in helping Africa to build its shipping. Our fleet right now is more depleted, but trade goes on and trading amongst ourselves is critical at this time. And we need to do it in a sustainable manner. And currently, we believe that if we get the necessary support, especially the technology on how to move things and how to fight the climate change, we'll all be on the same play field and we'll be able to support the global fight against um, climate change. I would not want to go too much into details into this once because of time, but I believe that um, Africa has come to the point where we have to take our industry the shipping and trade industry, a closer look, and to be able to be part of the global chain, the supply chain. We are encouraging coastal shipping. We are encouraging intra-African trade. And we are believing that starting from coastal trade, building the necessary infrastructure at the ports and um, leveraging on what is happening on the international scene, we should be able to join in the global fight for climate change. There's however the need for cooperation and collaborative approach to green and sustainable shipping. There's a need to push for innovation, to develop and implement solutions to combat climate change for the green and sustainable maritime sector, especially in Africa. In Africa, we are working on this. I thank you all for it. <laughs> thank you, Noah. Um, that touched on many areas, I think, both um, from the continent's viewpoint, but also from a global viewpoint. Um, and uh, I'd like to just um, uh, ask you a question on Africa. The, um, when we um, had Professor Alan McKinnon last week, um, he gave us some uh, statistics um, on freight decarbonisation and the issue around um, the carbon footprint of actually moving goods um, globally. One of the interesting things was actually that waterborne um, transport is um, by far the, um, has the lowest carbon footprint, particularly if you compare to um, short haul aircraft or um, if you compare to, um, uh, you know, freight, uh, freight on the road, for example, or, or and it's, it's much lower than rail as well. Um, and you talked, didn't you, about the, um, the fact that, um, that there's not much, uh, the, the proportion of trade between countries is low in Africa. Do you, do you see a, an opportunity in Africa um, for using more waterborne transport, perhaps even rivers and waterways? Are there examples sort of out there where, um, uh, transport, freight transport is moving on, on onto that form of transport as well as between 
um, you know, the, the, the maritime, the sea routes? Yes, um, like I said in my introduction, like Africa has a lot of, you know, when you look at its blue economy and you look at its vast nature, Africa has a great potential for maritime or seaborne trade amongst itself. You are looking at the, um, even when you look at the uh, West African coast from the shipping range of um, Senegal down to the southern part of Africa, all involves coastal tr um, transportation can take place amongst itself. Indeed, um, Africa has some of the hinterlands, but most of its countries are coastal states out of the 54. And I believe that we can do a lot of um, waterborne um, transportation within our African trade, intra-African trade. We can make use of our um, rivers, our lakes, and then the, even the um, sea, you know, um, because we do have it and we should, because it's less, we don't generate a lot of um, CO2 emissions and with waterborne and two, we don't um, tend to, it's less expensive for us and two, we are carrying raw materials most of the time, which are, you know, in volumes. Therefore, we need to use the sea more. This is where we call, um, on um, the developing um, on Africa to do more for its yeah. maritime transport. We need to do more to build our fleet and to encourage coastal uh, shipping to help us in our, in our trade as we continue to um, develop. And like mm -hmm. we said before, we depend a lot. 90% of our trade is by sea. And so we need to develop that urgently as we seek to yes. do more. Yeah. Yes. Good. Well, um, that, that, thanks for that, and thanks for that um, uh, interesting insight. There's a lot, lots again that we can pick up j just now in questions. Um, so I'm going to invite um, Sarinda and Margaret to come back on screen if they would. Um, and hi, uh, Sarinda. Hi, Margaret. Um, and uh, we've got some questions from the audience. Uh, we've had some. Um, which I, I think have been nobly answered by um, Sarinda and Margaret as we've gone through. So I'm not, I'm not going to go back into those specific questions unless the, um, if the questioner feels that they want to add a second question, um, do come in. So we've got a couple of questions that um, um, take us more into uh, Nar's presentation. Um, at the end there. So I'll start with those and we can then, I'd like to open it out into um, the whole um, training leadership area as well as the general topic. Um, but um, we've got a question here, Nar, um, about, um, it's based on, you, you mentioned the IMO um, and uh, there have been some significant um, measures put in place by the IMO to uh, drive decarbonisation, I know. Um, do you, uh, um, what Reshma is, um, Reshma from Malaysia here is asking, how does the IMO measure greenhouse emissions? How can they ensure such a reduction of 40%? Um, I don't know whether you've got um, a perspective on, on that in terms of that level of detail, but... Um, I would I wouldn't say that uh, these are more of the technical issues that are being dealt with daily by the um, IMO um, committee on um, marine environment and protection uh, uh, committee. I know that um, just this June, this month June, at their last uh, meeting. They were talking about the EEXI, and then the um, that is the um, energy efficiency um, design for um, um, new and existing ships. And then they were talking also about the carbon um, intensity indicator. But these are things that are dealt with mainly with the shipping companies. And IMO 
is in um, the committee, that is the MEPC committee, are those who deal technically with some of these things. I know that um, the EEXI is measuring the technical and the CII is the operational output and how they um, uh, put um, the measure, how the um, movement of a single individual ship carrying passengers or cargo is moving and at what speed. So these are some of the measures that I know that they are doing in spite of the fact that they have other things in place already. Yeah, no good. And uh, I think bringing the IMO into the equation is very important because um, in shipping, of course, there's very big global players in, in terms of um, um, the, the big shipping companies who work across country boundaries, across um, regional boundaries, don't they? And, and to impact them, um, obviously, needs an organisation like IMO to enforce certain things certainly in terms of use of fuels, um, in terms of new shipping, as you, you say, um, the, um, the, 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 the factor that we, whereas we, we change, we tend to change um, cars and uh, um, lorries on the road in terms of um, their cycle tends to be sort of 10, 15 years maximum. Ships, of course, a lot older, aren't they? And uh, um, so it's not easy to move to more efficient um, uh, ships in terms of um, the carbon footprint, is it? So the IMO has a big role to play. Um, and I'm sure if anybody's got um, some interest in that area, do look at uh, their website, etc. cetera. Um, the, um, the other question, uh, Na, is from Clements, but I think you touched on it when I asked you the question. It says, trading amongst Africans is a noble idea. What specific plans in sustainable short sea shipping are in place? And you spoke about um, waterborne transport, didn't you? Is, is there good cooperation amongst the African um, nations in terms of tackling sustainability? the agenda, especially of the um, African Union, because today, as we are talking, if you need to grow, you need to take sustainable I mean, actions and, and, and measures in order to keep afloat. And so um, sustainability is part of the AU agenda in all of this, in its blue economy strategy, in its um, um, intra-African trade, that is the African continental free trade, in every um, aspect, even in its um, single African air transport, all of this are taken care of, in, I mean, sustainability is taken care of in all these three um, areas of the transport um, industry, by sea and by air, and even by road. The AU specifies all of it in its agenda. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, so, so increasingly, um, particularly the Africa Trade Agreement we've seen and um, the Africa Union in terms of things are being um, started to look at in a pan-African viewpoint, aren't they? Which is, is yes. a significant development actually in Africa, yes. which is good. Yes. Now, yes. now um, I don't want Surinder and Margaret to... Um, uh, to relax too much, so I'm going to open up um, the, the uh, I've, I've got a question here. Um, do those, we've got about 15 minutes for questions, so attendees, if, um, if you want to ask a question, do put it into the Q&A. Um, but I'd like to um, touch on an area that um, all three of you have spoken about, which is sort of training. Um, and I'm, I'll ask, ask a very general question, really, about where you see the need for training to be um, in terms of skills. Um, so um, is it um, age group related? In other words, do our younger people have a much clearer understanding of um, sustainability and the issues than perhaps some of our um older people like me, um, our older generation. Um, so is it age-related um, training? Is it 
um, around skills at local level, you know, at, at, a, at a, I would say probably a worker level in terms of helping people un understand the way they operate and the impacts that has on the environment, or is it skills do we need to focus um, on um, actually managers and leaders of the organisation? What would be your perspective, each of you, in terms of where um, our training and skills focus should be? Um, or is it just on everything, really? Um, just uh, I'll, that, 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 I'm hoping, will give us um, three probably uh, quite different views. But, um, Margaret, do you want to lead us off in that territory? Yeah, thank you, Keith. I mean, it's got to be scalable. So the way I approach it in our region is I have cohorts that I call, say, the high school cohort. And then I have cohorts that I target that I call it community college or high school graduate, no college. And then there's the university slash middle skills level. And then there's kind of middle skills to executive level. So, I mean, we do have to frame it from that context scalable. I think probably one of the most serious things facing us right now is digitization and making sure the workforce, whether it's those currently working in the port community and in logistics and supply chain, or those that are in this K through 12 system, that they have the computer skills, um, they know how to work with software because this is, it's, it's here. I mean, digitization is happening in the European ports um, it's slowly coming to America, and I go back to, you know, what's the weakest link in the chain? We've all got to be on the same page on this, um, and it needs to be universal. I mean, we can't have that digital divide. So I think the technology skills are super critical. And, and that will be both at an um, operator level and at a, a more senior level in terms of um, providing the the um, the the ability and the opportunity to use that those digital skills. Yeah. So, Linda, your your perspective on um, uh, training skills um, and how that um, links with um, sustainability. Um, so, Keith, in the in the space of sustainability, especially in the role that we play. Uh, we are not specialized in uh, in any aspect of this. This is more like a service that we are trying to uh, do or uh, uh, impact we are trying to create. So it's a lot about getting the buy-in of everybody who is participating. And it's about um, educating and really showing people the impact that they have on the environment in the communities that we are in. So what we try to do is not just be involved with the most of our plants average about two to 3,000 people, about 2,500 people per plant in all our locations. So if you look at our, um, what we have to do sometimes is really work with those people and then the communities that we are in and you cover about five to 10,000 families. So you can have a seriously uh, impactful kind of um, initiative driven using the plant as a center. So we started doing that very successfully, but for more than, uh, more than training, it is just education. It is just creating the awareness and the education of the impact people have, because most people have absolutely no clue as to what they inadvertently do uh, to impact yeah. the environment. Yeah. So it's more about education. Yeah, yeah, and, and that, that, that's that's an interesting perspective, and I can see the way that you're also bringing that into the workplace as well, um, in terms of what people are bringing bringing in with their lunch and uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And we try to involve their families as well, so every from their children to their you know the the wider families, their parents, their spouses, get them involved in various social activity and have a lot of participative activity. As well. Yeah, yeah, which again is Margaret's stakeholder um, levels in action, really, isn't it, Margaret? I think. <laughs> um, no, your, your perspective from a, um, a, an African viewpoint, then, in terms of where the greatest training needs are um, and education needs, um, and you might, you know, just, just how do you see it? Um, 
you realize that uh, with Africa, when you look at the pyramid, our youth are the, um, the, the real base, mm. you know. Um, the youth for us and the women are a um, real concern in the sense that we need to bring them up to scratch. Yeah. The uh, education and training must go to meet the needs of our youth. You know, um, Africa's population, we say that it's a very young one because we have a lot of them and the youth. And um, growing, um, we, we should be investing in education and training for them to meet up with the global trends. I believe that um, if we can do this training and capacity building for our youth, especially, and even for our women, most of our women are in the informal sector. Mm -hmm. And um, most of them need to be brought up. Today, we are talking technology and digitalization, but these women, how many of them? So there's the need for us to bring them to scratch. So I would say that for Africa, it is very, very important to look to our youth and the women to bring them up through training, through exposure, to what is happening uh, technology-wise, and then to give them the opportunities needed to um, create jobs, even for themselves, so that uh, there won't be the issue of youth unemployment or, um, and that kind of a thing. So it is very important. Uh, education and training is very, very important, especially for uh, Africa's youth and women. Yeah, yeah. Now that, that, that I mean, that's, that, that, that's a very um, important area for the Institute to be involved in as well, um, as you say, yeah. sort of the... the um, what we call the next generation, the, the younger professionals and uh, um, the women um, in, in terms of equipping uh, equipping them um, in, you know, this, this whole area, which historically has been very ignored, hasn't it? Uh, we've got um, another question that's come in from, um, that's, that's um, I'll, has had an answer, but I'll bring it in because it came in from Edward Lau, and I think he's got a couple of answers that um, Surinders uh, Surinders made an answer here. But I'd like to open this up to the group because it seems quite pertinent to the three uh, three speakers and uh, to me and in, um, in in terms of um, an institute. So, how's the educational institute, business sectors, policy makers, and infrastructure providers aligning, or not yet? This seems to be the essential collaborative elements to make this possible. And are, how far are we on track now? And how far will we be, will we be by 2025? Um, Serena, you've answered that in Sri Lanka, it, happens to, it tends to happen in a sporadic um, task-related basis. Um, however, a far greater success would be achieved if formal collisions could, co could be created. Um, do you, do you, could you build on that a little bit in terms of answers? Then I'll bring Nara and Margaret in just for their perspectives on that one. Yeah, Keith, what tends to happen is when there's a project, like say, for example, the ocean cleanup or something like that, what uh, we would go to the relevant authorities that have uh, jurisdiction over that space. If it's reforestation, you go to the forest department, the wildlife department, speak with them, that then uh, we do, a, a, I'll, I'll draw an example from a project that we do of reforestation. We seed bomb. We have started making these seed bombs uh, and we go up in a helicopter and we drop them into wet soil. And so far, about 30, 40% success rate, the germination takes place and trees start growing. We have partnered with the wildlife department and the, the, forest, uh, uh, the department of forest conservation because it's their land. The Yafos, they help us with the choppers the Peradeniya University, one of our big universities in Sri Lanka that help us create and make the seed bombs. And what we do is facilitate getting those parties together. So what we do is look at a task and get the necessary people together to make that task su successful. However, there aren't any, there, uh, uh, 
that I know of, I could I could be wrong, but as far as I know, I don't know of any long-term partnerships like that that are created for um, to achieve a long, long, I'm sure there may be, but I don't know of any, to achieve long-term objectives that have been set out. So it's not a formal thing. We get together with people who will help us achieve our task. So still much to be done, I guess, is what you're saying, really. But the, the approach in terms of collaboration is very important. Um, Margaret, you, you, you've, when you were talking about the porch, you, you, you got into that territory in terms of working across boundaries and things. And I, I, just your example of the project uh, that I mentioned in terms of engaging with businesses. And uh, um, so from an academic organization building those bridges just just give give us your perspectives on um you know how Ed, edward's question here really um if you would well let, let me answer that question from the lens of the greater houston region we have a very collaborative environment I, I would put, say, the Port of Houston is part of that nexus as they've driven some partnerships between the logistics high schools, the community colleges, and the universities, and, and then industry. And we meet, you know, these five separate entities um, monthly, and we talk about collaborative opportunities. Um, we do, I mean, even from an academic standpoint, we collaborate with other universities in the region and other community colleges um, on some of our upskilling initiatives. I mean, I think, you know, we need to be doing this across the world where in these regional pockets, um, we're not doing it by ourselves, but we're collaborating with stakeholders at multiple scales. Um, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats, no pun intended, but I mean, it does take an active participation um, from everyone to, to raise that standard. And I think when we really consider the shortage of workers and the shortage of trained workers, um, if we don't do this collaboratively, it's not sustainable. Mm. No, oh, good. And that, that, that sort of reinforces what Serena was saying. Um, no, um, you've got um, a final perspective on, on this in terms of collaboration. You've already spoken about IMO and uh, you're clearly involved also in organisations that operate across um, uh, national boundaries. Um, are we doing enough? Would be the question. Do we need to do more? Oh, when it comes to collaboration, we can never say that we've done enough. Mm -hmm. There's more to be done at all times. If I, if I take the um, I'm example which you brought up, I'm always working with its donor partners, with UN agencies, with uh, uh, other countries like um, the World Bank, um, working with uh, maybe Norway, for example, I'm aware of uh, uh, Norway partnering with uh, the IMO to do what is called the Green Voyage, which will help um, small island uh, and um, small island developing states, and then the LDCs to have what is called the Green Voyage. You know, but these are uh, collaborative efforts that help in the long run. If I bring it back home, I know that um, with the institutes. The Institute co collaborates and cooperates with a number of the universities to bring up training courses for the youth. And even for those of us who are interested in taking, I know quite a number of people who have gone through the CILT um, programs that today they are using it to work and they are so professional. Some have gained their uh, the advanced um, certificates that today they can decide to go and do a master's program elsewhere. Some of them went through gradually certificate, diploma, and then advanced. I know some who are even working with us today who went through that process. And this is together with um, 
other universities in, in the different regions in, Accra, in, in Ghana. And um, the institute also collaborates with government when the government is coming out with policies that affect the transport industry. And they serve on some of the boards of government agencies to help them. And they do a lot of um, programs that would not only educate the youth, but to educate even agencies, government agencies who are into transport. So there's a lot of collaboration between the institute with the universities in Ghana, for example, with the uh, uh, ministries responsible for transport and aviation, and they serve on the um, on some of the boards. In fact, they are part of the policy making a, 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 a committee where they give advice to the ministries and agencies in relation to transport and logistics. Yeah, so I believe yeah. that such a thing is good for sustainable growth. Yeah, yes, and, and you rightly point to CLT Ghana because I know they're, they're one of our, our, our best advocates and uh, practitioners in terms of, as you say, ensuring the links um, are made and driving policy by talking to government and talking to um, uh, businesses and talking to the Training Institute. Well, that, that's been a fascinating um uh, hour and a half, we've come right to the end of our time and we have used every second of it. So can I, on behalf of um, everybody who's been watching this this morning and will be watching this over the coming weeks, um, thank our three speakers. Um, you've given us um, three uh, quite different, um, but in many ways, very strongly linked presentations. So on behalf of CRT, thank you very much for your time. Um, and your contribution this morning. It worked very well. So uh, we uh, we never know with these things, um, with uh, connectivity and everything, particularly when we're going across three continents. Um, so thank you um, all very much. Um, for those who are listening, um, we have our next um, uh, webinar, our final one in the series um, in the third week in um, July. Um, and we've got uh, a different perspective uh, again on uh, um, sustainability. Um, so look out for that. That's the last in the series. Um, we also move in the autumn into the subject of digitalization. So um, we're fairly pleased with ourselves because of the strong linkages there are with sustainability. Um, and that's been reinforced by the speakers again today. So do look out for that. Look out for our sustainability bulletin, which has got um, over 70 articles that have gone out. Um, and uh, this topic today um, will last and last, I think, um, becomes more important almost daily. So um, we won't just be dropping it in July. We'll continue to talk to collaborators we've talked about today um, with um, other organizations, with other members, with corporate members and with individual members globally. So thank you very much everybody for listening and uh, you have a good rest of the day wherever you are. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.